It is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Joseph Grant, who will speak about pre-projective algebras and fractional Calabria algebras. Great. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation and I mean, for running this seminar. I think uh, this has been really nice when we were locked down and it's still nice to have this going now where, where you know, we can all see these good talks across the world. Uh, so my talks on pre-projective algebras and fractionally Calabiar algebras, or fractional Calabiar algebras, one of the two. Uh, the slides are online, uh, so I'm going to write on the slides as I go with a pen, uh, and there's a version with some pre-written stuff up there or on my website, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll try and write on these as well. So I've now made this big, so I can't see the chat, and I can't see, uh, I can only see the slides, basically. So if anyone has an important question, can you can someone say something on microphone instead of um, uh, instead of writing on chat, please? Okay. Um, right. So first, what's the plan for the talk? Well, it's roughly in four parts. My the first thing I'm going to do is say what the words in the title mean. Uh, then, um, then okay. There, there's sort of a main there's a main result that I'm going to try and explain in the talk, and. The second part, I'm going to give a rough argument of why this result is true, so like a, a sketch proof. And then in the third bit, I'm going to uh, sort of elaborate on some of the more technical details of this proof, which, um, so th they're technical, but I think they're they're sort of conceptual as well. And I think they're, I find them interesting and useful bits to understand. So hopefully you will too. And then, um, so all of that's going to be sort of restricted to quivers. And then at the end, I'll say something about this sort of more general situation of higher homological algebra. So, okay, let's let's try let's try writing something. Uh, pen. Okay, yeah, I can underline things. This is the paper I'm going to talk about: Sayer functors and graded categories. I put this on the archive uh, this summer, and uh, it's. It's quite a long paper. It's like it's over sixty pages. That's partly because there's lots of big commutative diagrams, but um, but I'm, not, I'm saying that in comparison to the second paper which I put there. This is called uh, the Nakayama automorphism of a self-injective pre-projective algebra. So this is a much shorter paper. It's less than twenty pages, uh, and the story of this is that um, I wanted to understand the Nakayama automorphism of these pre-projective algebras using the Auslander Rayton theory of the underlying quiver. And uh, okay, so I, I sort of managed this in terms of the abelian category, uh, which is what this short paper was about. And then I thought, I mean, the more I thought about this, I thought this was clearer on the de derived level. So I thought, oh, I'll add an extra page to the end of this paper that explains this on the derived level. It's nice and clear there. And this this extra page sort of grew and grew until it's. Um, Belonged into a much bigger paper that I'm now going to talk about today, but even though it's even though it's bigger, I still think somehow it is conceptually clearer on this level. So hopefully I'll be able to communicate that, and hopefully you'll agree with me. Uh, okay. And uh, yeah, I guess I should check. You can see the slides, okay? And you can see the underlining, okay? Uh, it's... Yes. 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 Thank you. Okay. Right, so I've just copied the title in the abstract here. So this is the what do the words mean uh, uh, slide. So for the experts, I apologize. I'm going to start quite basic, but hopefully there will be something for everyone by the end. So, OK, I get sort of assume you know what quiver means. But I mean, I'm even going to, well, you need to know what a path algebra is, which I'll very, I'll sort of talk a bit about path algebras. Then. Uh, Pre-projective algebras. So these are the two different types of algebras in the talk. Right? The, um, uh, I guess, okay. The pre-projective algebra bit is the pre-projective algebra bit, and these factually Calabiar algebras are going to be the path algebras. So you also need to know what these words mean, right? Um, uh, factually Calabiar. I need to explain that, and. Um, the corresponding word that I need to explain for pre-projective algebras is Nakayama automorphism. Okay, um, and the the main result says that these things uh, 
so the underlying algebras, the underlying properties correspond. Uh, so I'm going to that, that's what I'm going to try and explain and give a, at least a sketch proof of. Uh, okay. So I'm just to check if I go back. Okay, if I go back, the the right the writing is kept brilliant. Okay, so uh, we start with a quiver. We always start with a quiver. So quiver Q. I'm going to have this running example. Uh, the web theorist favors quiver, the A3 quiver, linearly oriented. Uh, if I need to name the arrows, I'll call them A and B. Okay, so that's my quiver Q. Then I'm going to double it. So the traditional notation for this is Q with an, uh, a bar over the top. And by double it, I mean keep the vertices the same, but double the arrows. Okay, so there's, uh, there's my original arrows, A and B. And have some, uh, so I want to double them, by which I mean add arrows in the opposite direction, which I'll call B star and A star. Okay, and then I want to impose some fake commutativity relations. So this is easiest to understand at the vertex two. So at the vertex two, there are two ways to sort of go away and come back, which if we think of as like an X and a Y, this might make, um, you might understand why I say commutativity. So Okay, I can go from two to one and then back to two. So this means first do A star and then do A. Or I could go to three and back, which means first do B and then do B star. And I impose that these are equal. Okay, and then at the end vertices, I also have these fake commutativity relations. So, okay, at the vertex one, I can certainly do, um, uh, I can go, uh, a star, f sorry, A first, and then A star. And now I haven't got something on the left, so I imagine this is sort of falling off the quiver and this is zero. And similarly, at vertex three, I can do B star and then B, and this is also zero. So this quiver with these three relations defines an algebra. So I take the path algebra and quotient by these. And this is called the pre-projective algebra, and the notation is pi. Uh, OK, so if you like finite dimensional algebras and you want to study an algebra, the, one of the first things you might do uh, is try and write down the Lewy series, the sort of radical series of the projective modules. So let's do that. Um, so I think with this setup, if I want the projective cover of the simple module associated to the vertex 1, I want the paths which are going out of one. So I have the zero length path at the start. Uh, then I have the arrow A. And then, uh, okay, if I go back by A star, that's zero. So my next, so I have the path uh, which goes A, then B. That takes me to three. Okay, and then if I try and go back by B star, you can check that the relations, uh, it takes two steps, but the relations show that this is zero. Okay, similarly, um, if I start in the middle, uh, so I start at the vertex 2, I can go to 1, or I can go to 3, uh, and then I can come back to 2, and the relation said that I get the same result. Uh, and then, again, one can check that any anything you try and do after that gives you 0. Finally, uh, I'll be a bit quicker. For the projective 3, I get 3, 2, 1. Okay, so these are the projectives. Uh, okay, I can also do the injectives. So this would be a uh, pass into an arrow. So for the injective one, uh, I sort of start from the bottom and I've got one, uh, go into it from two and then go into it from three. I do two, uh, I'll just draw these, I get this. And the injective cover of three is this here. These are the injectives. Uh, there's some delay on my writing. But, uh, okay, so I've got three projectives and three injectives. And at least if you think these pictures sort of a, a good representation, the thing you should notice is these are the same uh, up to some, uh, except the order is different, right? Uh, so if I look at this one here, this is P1. My one is at the top. This is the projected cover of the simple module one. Uh, and if I look at the corresponding injective, 
this is uh, the injective cover of the simple module associated to three. Uh, that's going to be a three. Okay. So um, P1 and I3 are isomorphic. That's what I'm trying to say in a long-winded way. And, uh, okay. So, yeah, what do we notice about these? Uh, sorry, I left my water. Okay, so I claim they're the same uh, up to some permutation. Okay, so this is um, first. Let's have this look at this permutation. So I've got uh, maybe I'll call this row. Uh, I'm going to try clearing the screen and hope this makes it writing a bit faster. Uh, row. Uh, so this swaps one and three, and uh, it fixes two. Okay, and then um, what I was demonstrating on the last slide is that pi uh, is isomorphic to i of rho i. Okay, uh, so this permutation uh, controls how we identify the projective and injective modules. So I, I say this is because our algebra is self-injective. Uh, in fact, something slightly stronger is true. It's Frobenius. So there's lots of different ways to define a Frobenius algebra. One of them, uh, which I'm going to use today, is that if we look at, okay, we look at the algebra pi, we can act on the left or the right. So it's a, it's a bimodule over itself, right? We have a left pi action and a right pi action. And as a pi pi module, pi pi bimodule, this is isomorphic to uh, the k linear dual, a sort of ordinary vector space dual, which I'll denote with a star. Where on the left, uh, again, I act by pi. Um, but on the right, I have to twist by some algebra automorphism, alpha. Okay, so this alpha is the Nakayama automorphism. And uh, this is related to this, um, to this uh, permutation pi because... If I, uh, so EI denotes the length zero path for the vertex. Uh, if I want to look where this sends one of these length zero paths, it exactly comes from where this permutation sends the vertex. Okay, so this statement that, um, I mean, in sort of the weaker and stronger sense, both that, uh, okay, it's certainly folklore that this algebra was self injective. I think also that this Nakayama automorphism squares the identity. So there's, uh, I haven't proved that, but at least you can see that the permutation squares the identity. This was certainly known for a long time, uh, and uh, a careful proof was written down by Brenner, Butler, and King, published 2002. Uh, there's lots of sort of earlier work, but I think uh, I'd, I'd be really interested if someone can point to a precise earlier statement. I've, I've tried to. I've asked around and haven't found anything earlier. Uh, at least that I that I can that I can understand. Uh, okay. Um, so that's the pre-projective algebra. Right, let's. Uh, so now we move on to the path algebra. So again, uh, I want this running example that my quiver has vertices one, two, and three, uh, and arrows like this. So there's this famous theorem of Gabriel that Q is dinking precisely when the path algebra has finitely many indecomposable modules. So this, this is a dinking quiver of type A. Uh, so by dinking, I mean an ADE graph, uh, these famous graphs that turn up in rep theory and Lie theory. And uh, we can look at these indecomposable modules and look at the maps between them. And that gives us quite a good picture of the category. So I'm going to try and draw this now. Uh, so let me try and draw the projectives like I did before. So I'm going to start with the third projective. So this is the path out of three, and there's only the trivial path. So I have, uh, so it just has, it's a simple module, the projective cover of three. And then the projective cover of two, uh, I have paths out uh, the trivial path and the one going to three. 
Uh, and uh, objective Kevlar 1 looks like this. So you can see this is a this algebra looks quite different to the pre-projective algebra. It's a it's not self-injective. It's um, it's finite global dimension. It's hereditary. I can now uh, try and do the injectives. So the injective cover of three is the same as the projective cover of one here. It's uh, one, two, three. Uh, the other injectives are one, two, and one. And one can check that I've only missed one decomposable module, which is the simple module two. OK, and I can draw the maps between these. There's certainly inclusions between the projectives, uh, surjections between the uh, injectives. Uh, and OK, I'll draw in the other maps. And we have a commutativity relation here and two zero relations along the bottom. So this is the Aslander writing quiver. Uh, and yeah, maybe I said this out loud, but maybe it's useful for me to write down. This is, um, these are projective three, projective two, and projective one. So I'm, I'm sort of abusing notation here, right? Earlier P3, well, PI is now a module for the path algebra KQ, whereas previously I was using PI to be a module for the um, pre-projective algebra PI. Okay, but um, okay. So the thing to notice here is that again we have projective one is isomorphic to injective three, but the other ones don't match. Okay. So now uh, this is an easier algebra, but we want to think about a more complicated gadget. We want to think about the the derived category. And because path algebras are quite easy, the derived categories are quite easy. Uh, they, at least the sort of bounded finite dimensional derived category, it just has objects indexed by the modules and an integer. So if I copy out the picture I just drew, uh, three, oh, that's not a good three. Uh, three, uh, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one. And two. So there's the picture I just had. I should draw um, another copy of this. I'll draw by here. But um, these have some shift. This is a shift as a chain complex. So it's one. Okay, and there are some maps. There are some extra maps like this. Maybe I should finish drawing this. Uh, one, two, one. Okay, so this map uh, from, from the module one, two to the shifted module three corresponds to the fact that we have an extension. We could extend this module one, two by the simple module three, as we can see here by this by the, the fact that we have a module whose Levy series is one, two, three. Okay, so we have um, so that's uh, so that's two copies, but also we have like we have negative copies. So I won't draw it all out, but I'll I'll do a few. And so we have one, two, and three, minus one, minus one, minus one, and uh, okay, and there's this nice regular picture that we have. So I've used two different notations for the shift here. If I have a module, I've written uh, m shifted by one, which is perhaps the more common notation. But this, this shift is also a functor. And if I want to think of it as a, as a functor, I want to write it on the left. And then I'll often write it as a capital sigma. OK, so these two notations mean the same thing, m shifted by one and sigma m. Okay, so this is the derived category. Oh, the one there was one other thing I wanted to say. There's a functor that um, that exists here. That um, so I've drawn this in a certain way. There are these sort of horizontal lines. Okay, so I can move along like this. There's some symmetry, sort of shifting along like this, and. This on objects is the action of a functor, which is the inverse Auslander-Wakeman translation. 
Okay, this existed on the um, abelian level as well, but it, uh, it's very nice on the derived level. It just shifts everything sort of one unit to, to the right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Right, so now I need to say something about Sayer factors. So let's let C be a linear category. This just means it's home sets of vector spaces. And then if we have an, an endo functor, um, uh, which okay, uh, will be is going to be an equivalence from C to C. This is called a Sayer functor if it satisfies Sayer duality. So this means that uh, if I look at the home space in C from an object X to an object Y, I write homes in this sort of category theoretic way where I just write the category and then have some brackets. I want um, a fixed isomorphism where I go to the objects uh, the other way around, but I need to apply my functor to the second object, and I need to take the vector space dual. This is natural uh, in my objects x and y in my categories. So uh, these. Uh, defined by Bondel and Kapranov. They've been around a long time and sort of very useful in algebraic geometry, representation theory, lots of parts of maths. Uh, they don't always exist, but our path algebra has finite dimension as a vector space, and also it has finite global dimension, so projective resolutions uh, stop after finitely many terms. And because of this, it does have a Sayer functor. And really, the only thing you need to know about it today is it sends projectives to injectives, really um, respecting this, this index that I said. So it sends PI to II. OK, and now, um, now I can give the definition the, the defined in one other word I haven't defined, or phrase. So we say that our category is fractionally collabial if it has a Sayer functor, and there are two integers uh, such that some power of the Sayer functor to one of the integers gives a power of the shift functor, where, um, which we call it by the other integer. So, um, yeah. So maybe Calabio categories are more famous, where uh, Q is equal to one. But this this definition makes complete sense. And uh, okay, if I, yeah. So the derived category of a quiver. So I should I should write on this slide. Uh, Q is still A D E Dinky. This is important. Is AD Dinkin. Um, then this derived category is fractionally Calabial. Um, and there's a difference of two right, between these two powers. So, again, this was, I want to say this is folklore. So, at least some sort of slightly weaker version of this was known to, was known to Gabriel, and you can find it in the equal proceedings from around 79, 80. Um, and I think this was the main motivational example in the definition, which was due to Konsevich. But again, the actual, if you want to see a careful proof written down, this didn't happen until the beginning of the uh, this century. And this was done by Miachi and Jacupieli. Uh, and so I want to just go through this example. So if I draw the picture of the derived category we just had, I won't draw all the, um, I won't keep track of what the objects are. I'll just keep track of sort of where the objects are and the morphisms between them, which, uh, which makes sense because I'm a good category theorist. And uh, maybe I'll sort of record how my abelian category sits within it to various shifts. So, uh, OK, so there's my derived category. It continues both to the left and to the right. Here is the module projective 1. There's the module projective 3 which is injective one. Oh, I've got this wrong, haven't I? Uh, this was projective three. So projective three, that was projective one. I can't delete, which is slightly annoying. Uh, that was injective three, and this was injective one. OK. So I told you that the Sayer functor sends the projective to the corresponding injective. So it sends uh, this projective to this injective, P3 to I3. Okay, and then 
If I3 is P1, then we can do this again. P1 is sent to I1, so that goes there. Okay, and now, by now, uh, I'm not going to justify this bit as much, but I'm going to say we have a nice picture and we hope things behave nicely. So uh, if that happens, this should be sent to there. And this should be sent to there. And if we look what this is, it's P3 shifted by 2. Okay, and we can also do this with, uh, say, this here. So this is uh, P2. This is I2. So we sort of shift um, forward like this. Again, if I do this four times, I should send it to P2 shifted by 2. So, I mean, this isn't a proof, but this is very strong evidence that uh, if I apply the say functor four times, then this is isomorphic to shifting twice. Okay, and notice that four is two plus two. So, um, okay, the, um, so now sort of I've, I've explained what these two things are and uh, and the main result of the talk is meant to say that they're related and exactly how they're related in a precise theorem. Uh, I should say that that it was it's known that they were related. So this at least um, sort of some partial results are in a paper of Hirschend and Yama, uh, one of their two papers published in 2011. Uh, but I think you need some certain homogeneity uh, condition, which is quite strong. So this I don't think this works in general and. Um, and I think using just results from this paper, the sort of you only get results about to twists. So we'd like we'd like something which covers all these thinking quivers and really gives on the nose, right? Um, that these two things are equivalent. Some sort of the fact that the Nakayama automorphism of the preprojective algebra squares to the identity, and that the category is fractionally collabia. So that's the aim of the talk. Uh, I'll make the screen smaller. This is probably a good time to pause if anyone's got any questions. Or... Okay, I don't see anything. So I'll make it big again. Uh, and carry on. Okay. So... I've now explained what the words meant, and I'm going to try and say something about how you prove that these two properties are equivalent. So the first thing is that um, it's well known that uh, these functors commute. Uh, so in fact, uh, yeah, maybe um, it's well known that the say functors commute with everything. This was in, I think, the original paper. So, okay, we're going to take this fractionally collabial relation and rearrange it. Uh, so. Okay, so I've got S P plus two. Uh, I'm deliberately writing equals in a very sloppy way, right? This is meant to be some some sketch sketch proof. Now I'm gonna on the left here, I'm gonna multiply by the identity. So uh, what do I want? I think I want S P S minus P sigma P. Okay, so this is still SP plus two. Now I'm gonna multiply on the left by the inverse of S to the P. So I get S squared is uh, uh, S to the minus P sigma to the P. Sorry, this uh, is meant to be sigma to the P. And now I'm gonna rewrite that as inverse there uh, composed with shift the power of the p okay so um i should say i should point out and i'm sure you've noticed but to do this i had to use the fact that um that they commute okay so use uh use this commutation relation between these functors uh and then i can say okay so what's what's this functor uh shift then say inverse well this is just the Outland of Eipen translate that I showed you on the picture earlier, the um, some well, derived inverse version of the AR translate. So what this rough argument shows uh, is or suggests is that this uh, excuse me 
this factually Calabiao relation on the derived category corresponds to a different relation on the derived category, which is if I do the stair functor twice, I should get some power of the inverse AR translate. Okay, so this is the first um, the first bit of the argument. Okay, now I want to move from this derived category to the pre-projective algebra somehow. So the way to do this is to use orbit categories. So these, uh, lots of people have worked on these. Uh, they, I mean, they sort of, I think they sort of got famous from uh, this original cluster categories paper of um, Boo and Marsh, Reinecke, uh, Wright and Todorov, uh, because they used them to construct the cluster category. But then there's work of uh, there's work of Keller on the triangulated structure, Sibyls and Marcus. I think were the first people to do sort of a to really study these things and um, and especially sort of the equivalences you get by taking them. And then uh, there's work of Asashiba, which I mentioned later. And there's probably other people on to get. But yeah, well well studied things now. Uh, so I'm going to draw this derived category again. Uh, okay, again, I'll draw my uh, objects and morphisms. Okay, and the idea is um, I have this action uh, of tall or tail uh, shifting things left and right, and I want to take the orbits of that. Uh, so there's sort of there's sort of a different ways to do this. Uh, the naive way is you literally just take the orbits. A sort of fancier way is you um, add in extra morphisms to make the to make all things in the orbit isomorphic within this category. But um, let's just do the naive one for now. So I draw these. I draw an object for each orbit, and then I try and draw the maps between them. So you can see uh, I have maps uh, going. Okay, I certainly have maps going like this and back down like that. And, uh, okay, this looks like the quiver of the pre-projective algebra. And, I mean, if you really sort of follow the maps along and see what the relations are, you really get the relations of the pre-projective algebra. And uh, you get a grading on this as well. So this, um, so if I choose some, there's different ways to say this. I mean, if I first add isomorphisms to make them all like, uh, to make all, objects in an orbit isomorphic, then to get down to this thing with sort of finitely many objects, I want to take a skeleton. And there's really a choice of skeleton. This corresponds to taking some fundamental domain. So maybe uh, let's choose some fundamental domain which looks like our quiver we started with. OK, and then you can see that the arrows going upwards stay within this fundamental domain. So, they, so we'd say they have degree 0, whereas the arrows going down um, fall out of this fundamental domain and we have to apply this functor uh, that we're quotient by, quotienting by again to get back to our fundamental domain so they'll have some non-zero grade i mean on, with some conventions it's going to be plus one okay so this is this is how you get um well a category that looks like the pre-projective algebra using this orbit algebra construction this orbit category construction sorry so uh Okay, there's a comment I wanted to make here. I'm not going to explain this completely, but the fact that the derived category has a Sayer functor shows that um, the pre-projective algebra is self-injective. So this is due to Iyama and Opperman in 2013. And I think this has been sort of assimilated into the consciousness now, but but I think this was quite like revolutionary. Before, before this observation, I don't think there was a proof that this algebra was self-injective that didn't rely on sort of some complicated combinatorics whereas once Iyama and Oppenheim noticed this um, it's sort of you know a nice uh, a very clear and a short consequence of this structural property of the derived category so um oh yeah okay so I'm, maybe I should say something about um this interpretation as orbit categories I mean this was certainly used used very powerfully by Iyamo and Opperman, but it sort of it sort of goes back further. I mean, the, there's this biogeigal lensing description of the pre-projective algebra, which is which is sort of an orbit category, even though they didn't say it that way. And and of course, even when it was introduced by Gelfand and uh, Ponomarev, they I mean they wanted to use this, I, I think, to to capture uh, to capture properties of the representation theory. So. Uh, 
So this description probably goes back away a little while. Okay, so what's um, what's the result of doing this? We got we got to this description, right? We said um, we translated Fatshley Calabier into this uh, into this underlying description between the Serre functor and the inverse AR translate. And now, um, if we're quotienting by the inverse AR translate, then you think uh, this sort of goes to nothing. This goes to an identity, but really the gradient keeps track of it. So we're expecting something like applying the Serre functor twice on the orbit category should give us some grading shift by by p. Okay, so um, I mean, now we're getting now we're getting close to something squaring to the identity. Okay, so um, finally we need to move from this um, this orbit category with three objects to an algebra. So I'll at least say how to move from a category of one object to an algebra, which I mean I'm sure you know. You you just take the morphism space. Uh, again, my categories are linear, and I claim that the same functor for this category gives a Nakayama, or oh, I shouldn't say functor, I should say automorphism for the algebra. So this is a nice thing to explain. My algebra, uh, let me write this out again, my algebra is uh, the morphisms from my dot to my dot. Okay, now I'm going to suppose I have a Serre functor. So this is isomorphic to uh, dot comma Serre dot with a dual. Okay, but um, because there's only one object, my Serre functor must send this object to itself. So this really is C dot comma dot, which is A. I have a dual. But this functor, if, when there's one object, the functor can still act non-trivially on morphisms, which are elements of the algebra. So this corresponds, so this does, um, this does twist the action, right? Uh, natural, the, the naturality uh, with respect to the functor X, S corresponds to twisting on the right by this algebra automorphism induced by the functor. Okay, so now, now we've got a whole sketch proof to, we uh, I've done the summary below. We start with this factually Calabier property uh, on the derived category. We swap this over to something in terms of different functors on the derived category. Then we, we go to the orbit category and get this something in terms of a Serre functor and a uh, grading shift. And then we move from the orbit category to the pre-projective algebra, and we really get an algebra automorphism and a grading shift. This is, um, I mean, if you forget about the grading, uh, I mean, which I mean you shouldn't, but you but you might want to if, if you're thinking about this for the first time, then this is like having a finite order Nakayama automorphism. I'm sorry this writing isn't so legible, but hopefully hopefully it's making some sense. Okay, so that's uh, I think that's the second part of the talk on what's the rough argument. Again, I'll, I'll pause briefly. Uh, Okay. Now, um, how do you do it properly? So, I mean, I'm going to talk about some of the some of the details when you try and make this rigorous. So, something which I'm sure you noticed is that um, I really started working with these these functors as if they were sort of elements in an abelian group, and saying this equality that I work with should really be an isomorphism. I mean, I really have a natural isomorphism of functors, right? I have. Um, I have some category, I have some functors, I mean, they they happen to be uh, auto-equivalences, and I have some natural isomorphisms between compositions of these. Uh, so this is this is too categorical. Okay, I have um, really a two set, the, the two category of categories, or small categories or something. Well, I have no cells, one cells, and two cells. And, okay, so I guess people know sort of the standard example of a two category, hopefully you've seen before, is, is what you get from categories functors like and natural isomorphisms. But algebra and algebra morphisms and algebra automorphisms may be 
you don't think of too categorically. But actually, I mean, this is a sort of standard example you get in these introductory category theory books. Often with groups, they'll do it. They'll have some category of groups and group homomorphisms and conjugation maps. Uh, so this is a two category. Uh, and I mean, this matches sort of the maths here and what we know about it. The Nakayama automorphism is only unique or defined up to an inner automorphism, just like a Serre functor is only, I guess, defined up to natural isomorphism. So we do have a two category on the other side where the pre-projective algebra lives as well. So we have algebras, homomorphisms, and uh, inner automorphisms. So if you want to transfer things across, you really want to work with these two categories. Or, I mean, there's, you, can, you can do it slightly differently because really we only work with a single zero cell. So you can um, do this looping or de-looping and get, work with monoidal categories. But I mean, there's some higher, higher categorical structure that we're, we're using here. Um, and to do things properly and to do things well, I think it's important to, to recognize this and to use it. Uh, and once you, once you do this and start looking at it carefully, you can, you can move between these things in a two, in a two functorial way. Uh, the qualification, I should say, is uh, at least on the core. So I'm going to want to do this. You, you need to create two functors, which do things like take um, uh, sort of an additive closure. Then maybe you, you need to take idempotent completions a lot. But you also need to take... Um, take indecomposable objects. We saw that the AR quiver was a picture of the category of indecomposable objects. And if you have a general um, functor between two uh, additive categories, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't give a functor between their category of indecomposable objects, but an equivalence does. Okay, so certainly on the level of sort of two groupoids, this, this does all work in the two, categor two categorical level. So I'm sorry I'm being a bit vague here. I think uh, hopefully that's helpful for some people. Um, okay, let's let's go into somewhere I'll be a bit more specific. So all big categories, we need to deal with these properly. So luckily, Asashiba has really worked out how all the categories work in a two categorical setting. Now, there's there's two there's two things which are in the literature called graded categories. So if you look at um, even some of the works on Serre functors where they talk about uh, all things with triangulated categories where you carry around this distinguished auto equivalent like a shift, there's um, people talk about these as graded categories because they have uh, you know, a, a, an auto equivalence or an automorphism uh, which gives a action of the, of the free abelian group of rank one. Right? Uh, and people say this is a graded category. But um, this doesn't match the idea of like a graded algebra, which you might think of as a one object graded category. Then you should really expect the HOM set to be graded. And these are, these are actually both perfectly valid ways of dealing with graded categories. They're just, I mean, they're, they're equivalent to categorical constructions. And this is what, um, so, and the way to go between them is by taking orbit categories, at least in one direction. So this is what Asashiba worked out. And, um, the left-hand side of equivariant categories is sort of, uh, you have to be a bit careful, but it's, uh, but, but I don't think there's any big surprises. The possibly surprising thing here is that in the home graded categories setting, there are more one cells than you might expect. But right? if you, if you embed, um, if you embed just uh, the two category of graded algebras, into the two category of home graded categories, then this isn't going to be locally fully faithful because you, you're not going to have enough one cells. Right? This, um, you should be allowed to have functors which are not overall homo homogeneous, but are homogeneous of different values with respect to different objects. This, um, this maybe isn't, uh, hopefully this sounds pl a plausible, a reasonable thing to do, but it's maybe not immediately obvious to do, and this is, uh, but this is the correct way to do the category so that it matches up. So this is these degree adjusters. Uh, so I just want to illustrate the left-hand side, the equivariant categories, um, in terms of a situation that I guess lots of people know, which is triangulated categories. So, I mean, this is sort of a really elementary observation, but 
out of it. I still, I still found it helpful. Um, so triangulated categories are things, are categories with triangles in them. Right? And what's a triangle? It's a sequence of maps that look like this. Okay, x to y to z to the shift of x. Now suppose we have some functor uh, capital phi, and this could go between different categories, but just for simplicity of notation, let me just say it's an endo functor. So this is going from my derived category or whatever triangulated category to itself. If I just apply this literally, right, I get um, phi of x, phi of y, phi of z. And now if I apply it to this morphism, I get phi of sigma x. Okay, so I get my morphisms here, here, and here. And uh, now this doesn't give me a even potential, it, this doesn't give me a candidate triangle, right? Because I really want the thing at the end of my triangle to be a shift of the thing at the start. And the thing at the start is uh, phi of x. And these two things are not the same, right? They, um, you, so you want some map here. I mean, often, often in some setups, people really say that the shift should really commute with everything, that these should be the same. But it really, I mean, if you want to look at these a bit more carefully, you, it's, you really should think about these natural transformations, which go from phi, uh, phi sigma to sigma phi. Okay, so um, one might denote this by a little phi. This is the sort of structure you have to keep uh, track of in this two category. So, I mean, this is really like this is really like something you might see in an introduction to triangulated categories. So, I'm um, I don't mean to insult people by emphasising this point, but this is certainly something that I had previously ignored as just a technical detail that wasn't very important, but that I realised when doing this really is quite important in this stuff. Uh, okay. So now. Once we realize that to do things too categorically, we need to take care of this grading stuff, then there's actually a better definition of strong, of uh, fractionally collabi L. So I think, I think it's Keller who realized that, uh, or pointed out that really the collabi L condition should work with these, um, with these sort of equivalent functors rather than, uh, rather than just a natural isomorphism of functors. Uh, and it should be a morphism uh, yeah, and uh, also, so something I also learned from reading work of Keller is that uh, sort of the naive way to make the shift functor into an equivalent functor is not a triangulated functor, right? Because of this rotation axiom, you need to have a sign of minus one. Uh, and so there's actually a more sort of sophisticated definition of fractionally collabial, where I take some equivalent stair functor to the power p and some equivalent or triangulated shift functor to the power Q. Okay, so um, S here is some natural transformation which should satisfy some compatibility condition which I'm not going to go into. It's not that complicated, but I won't do it now. And actually, Vandenberg showed that um, this is equivalent to, uh, well, Vandenberg and I guess Sibyls uh, showed that this is equivalent to, uh, to the fact that this equivalent functor really is a triangulated functor. So, uh, I mean, I think this is this is sort of quite amazing. In fact, that we can, you can recognise. One of the things this says is that you can recognise the triangulated Sayer functor without using the triangles in the category. You just recognise this from the graded structure of the category. Uh, that's um, again, I, this surprised me when I realised when I understood this. Okay, so good, um, but everything on these slides above is equivariant with respect to the shift functor sigma. But to get the pre-projected algebra, we need to we need to quotient uh, or orbit by the inverse AR translate. Okay, so we need to move over from this sigma equivariant situation to this um, to this tau tau equivariant situation. Okay, so we can do that. Um, so the so there's an observation which I think goes back to Bundle and all of the say functors commute with. Okay, but everything is very vague. Uh, I should say, let's have um, F 
is a is a auto equivalence of the category C. Okay, then there's this nice argument which shows that um, that we that we have some commutation relation. Right, you take your category and you consider two arbitrary objects, x and y, and you apply um, f first to y, and then you apply the Serre functor. Okay, so um, you can remove the Serre functor from the right, so the cost of swapping things around and introducing a dual. Uh, a dual. So this is uh, okay. So we get this. Now I want to um, move my f to the other side. F is a, I mean, f is an equivalent, so I have a quasi inverse. So this is c of y of f inverse x dual. Okay. Now, um, now I want to use my say duality again to um, again swap the order and put the put the say on the right and get rid of the duality. So. C of f inverse uh, y. Uh, no, I've done something wrong there, haven't I? F inverse x. Say so y, and the dual disappears. Okay, and now I uh, bring f over to the other side, and I get uh, C of x f s y. Okay, so. This is this is natural, and um, uh, notice the difference here. I've got uh, on one side I've got SF, and on the other side I've got FS. And so, by some uh, you know, being you need a lemma or some maybe, well, we're going to get a map from uh, SFY to FSY, and everything is natural. I mean, this really gives us a natural isomorphism. Okay, so this is um, this is a really useful observation, and this is uh, a lot of the analysis here involves uh, involves studying this chain of isomorphisms. Okay, so uh, uh, and you can actually use this to make sigma equivariant things uh, touring this equivariant. So if I have some functor. Um, I have something like that, and I want to get an actual transformation which takes me to something like uh, this. Uh, okay, so first I just use this definition of the inverse AR translate. I have uh, by S inverse uh, sigma. Okay, now. Um, Okay, I, I haven't quite justified this, but if I sort of, well, roughly multiply on the left and the right by S inverse on that equation above, I get a way to to commute S inverse with any functor. So I can move, uh, so I can do this and leave the sigma on the right the same. Okay, and then, um, and then I can, uh, if I'm assuming that my functor, my original functor, is sigma equivariant, then I have some morphism here. So identity there, and then I use this uh, this natural transformation that I was saying about, and then this is it. This is a way to make uh, to change the equivariance. Okay. So this um, the reason this works uh, and behaves well is that. Uh, I mean, the Serre functor really belongs to the, the Drinfeld center of the monoidal category of auto equivalences of our graded category. So there's, um, there's various sort of lemmas you need to check, but, um, but this, is, this is the basic construction that makes everything work. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay, so we want to understand these commutation morphisms well. So I should say lots of people have um, worked on this. So there's uh, Keller, the Dugas, uh, and Chen, Zhao uh, uh, Chen. And using this, you can show that if we, um, so maybe I should remind you that uh, drawing this is S minus, or S in the sigma. Okay, so 
I can make a sort of equivariant version of door inverse, uh, which is sigma equivariant, and I can transfer it over using this procedure to the to the two in, to the two inverse equivariant setting. Uh, you might you might think that uh, that uh, this would necessarily be something trivial, but it isn't, right? As, as we saw, even with the sort of the shift functor as a shift functor equivariant morphism, you really can have a non-trivial commutation morphism. But the important result is that you don't get one. You really get the identity as the commutation morphism here. And this this is nice when you want a quotient by uh, this to get results. And so if you put these details together in this sort of rough argument I gave you before, you see that this strong fractionally collabial property for the derived category really does give that um, that the square of the Nakayama automorphism just induces this grading shift by um, by an integer on the pre-projective algebra. Uh, okay, and I should I should note here that the alpha is a is not a is not quite the classical Nakayama automorphism. Right, if you sort of look at the definition of that in one of the standard textbooks, there's actually a sign shift um, to do with the degrees and uh, and okay whether. So which Nakayami automorphism you want to use sort of depends on what you want. Uh, but I mean, for me, one of the reasons the pre-projective algebra is an important and interesting object is because it packages up the whole derived category uh, of the path algebra of the quiver. And I mean, if that's, if that's your motivation, then I claim that this is the good definition of Nakayama automorphism in this situation. But um, but I mean, this is, it's sort of quite a minor thing, like these, these signs tend to go away in, in most of the applications. Okay, so that, that's all the details of the proof. And I want to say something about higher homological algebra. So without giving many details, I mean, you either know this or you don't, and I'm not going to teach this to you in, uh, at the end of this talk. But uh, you can generalize a lot of the nice things about quivers to this class of algebras which have a D cluster tilting module. So this is due to work of Iyama, and I mean, lots of people have to Iyama. Uh, these are called D representation finite algebras. They're some subset of D hereditary algebras. And with a little bit more work, you can, I, we can get our theorem, I can get the theorem to work in this situation. Okay, so the fraction Calabiel property of the algebra is equivalent to some finite graded Nakayama automorphism for its higher pre-projective algebra. So this, this sort of brings together some results in the literature. So some of the most uh, uh, well-studied and uh, well-loved examples of uh, derepresentation finite algebras are these higher Auslander algebras, especially of type A. And both sides of this were already known, right? The, the finiteness of the Nakayama automorphism was known by, due to work of Hirsch and Niyama. And the fractionally Calabiao property was known due to work of Dickhoff, Yasso, and Mold. And, uh, and I should also say this is symplectic geometry proof due to Dickhoff, Yasso, uh, Yasso, and Lakili. And um, I was going to draw a picture of the quiver, but I won't now. Uh, the, I mean, this theorem sort of moves between, so my theorem moves between these results. It says you can start with one of these results and use it to obtain the other one. But it's, it's nice to be able to get something new. So, I wanted to have some example of an algebra where we knew one side and not the other. So you get some from uh, these Posnikov diagrams, which come up in the study of, I think, homogeneous coordinate rings of, of Grassmannians. Uh, so, okay, I won't try and reference everyone, but there's, but there was certainly, so when these, some of these algebras are self-injective, was studied by Pascal, Pasquale, and he also determined how to work out the Nakayama automorphism from uh, rotating the Posnikov diagram, the corresponding quiver. And if you take cuts, okay, these are known to be two representation finite. If you take, uh, sorry, if you take certain cuts, you're known to get two representation finite algebra. This is work from Hirschen and Niyama in their other paper of 2011. And so you do get some algebras which this theorem now shows are fractionally collabia. Uh, okay. That's that's all. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments?
Hmm. Oh, I can see a comment here from uh, Keller. It's, it's due to Verdier. Um, what, uh, which, which result should I attribute to Verdier? Um, oh, the um, is this about? Well, no, maybe I won't try and guess. <laughs> Do I know a quiver that is the sign in the triangulated shift functor? Functor. Okay, thank you. Okay, this is the sign in the triangulated shift functor is due to video. Uh, do I know a quiver that is factually collabial with finite global dimension that has an acyclic quiver? Non-acyclic. Uh, no, I don't. No. Um, no, I think that's a good question, and I don't know. Okay, from Nick Williams, when you are looking at higher homological algebra, are you therefore looking at the higher pre-projective algebra? Um, I mean, yeah, I, I, I guess so, and it depends what you mean by higher homological algebra. But if you're looking at the, um, if you're looking at this sort of um, subcategory of the derived category, uh, and if you're looking at sort of the the subcategory of the derived category, which is the uh, the pre-projective components. Uh, so this um, this is often called sort of curly U in the notation of papers of Yama. This comes up in like the paper of uh, Hitchens, Yama, and Oppermann. Then, then yeah, you sort of are look. This this at least corresponds to the higher pre-projective algebra. It um, so yeah, it's. I guess, like um, like in the classical situation, if you want to know things about, you know, the the regular modules of a of a you know non-finite quiver, then this isn't captured in the pre-projective algebra. The same statements hold in the higher situation, but um, but the pre-projective algebra holds the information about the pre-projective components, which in these derepresentation finite settings is everything. Uh, yeah, everything in this, in this, even in this sort of certain subcategory of the derived category, I should say. Thanks. Is there hope to obtain a classification of factually collabial algebras with finite global dimension up to derived equivalents? I, I don't know. I um, I think that would be great, but I, I have, I have no idea how to go go about how to start such a thing. I think. Yeah. Um, I, I don't. Um, I don't want to say there's no hope because it's always a it's a it's a dangerous thing to say that something can't be done. Right? But I I wouldn't know how to make such a classification. But shouldn't it include like all symmetric algebras, uh, classification of all symmetric algebras up to derived equivalence or something like that? Because it should be all B0 Calabria. I, I missed the very beginning of that, Is of something of all. Shouldn't this such a classification include a classification of all symmetric algebras up to derived equivalence? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah, it should. I mean, maybe you want to. Okay, uh, yeah. Okay, this is clarification. Yeah. And I mention. Yeah, and I mean, and I guess you could also sort of hope you could. You could say sort of factually collabio, but not collabio. You might want to impose this as well, and then. Um, is there another question being written? I can see Mikhail Gorski is writing something. Please also feel free to unmute yourself and ask the questions normally.
Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, okay. So, yeah, I've, I've read the question. So, one would prove that the bounded derived category of the incidence algebra of the Tamari lattice is fractionally Calabrian. Do I think it might induce the finiteness um, of the Nakayama automorphism of a certain algebra? Uh, I, I would like to think so, but I have no, uh, I don't have much evidence for this. I think I think this result of Rognamund on, um, on Chapotons conjecture i think this is a really nice result and i'd like to understand this better and i mean this is um i mean i, I sort of like to just know and i i uh yeah i mean this is something that i've that i think would be fun to work on but um I, I i would like to hope so but i can't uh yeah i would like to hope it would but that's that's i mean i, I, I can't present much evidence for this Okay, are there any other questions? I can see someone typing again. Yeah, but uh, maybe this can be also asked in the breakout rooms, or <laughs> you also can feel free to ask it with your voice. But uh, if not, then let's think and do again. <laughs> 